Uh, I've already planned, God has given me for our next book, we're going to study the Bible, and I think it's a very important book, and it's Esther. We're going to study about Esther. Uh, it was She was the queen that saved Israel. Yes. Mm -hmm. Esther's a very good thing. So, yeah, we're looking forward to that. Uh, so let's, let's go to the Lord prayer. Attempt to finish chapter 13 <clears throat> and then move on to 14. 14 is a preview of what's going to happen. It's a preview of the order of events that will happen, and then, of course, we get into the meat of the revelation where it talks about the end of, uh, of time. Um, On the notes that I give you, and I know you study them, because people do ask for them, and I'm sure they do study them, um, but they can, and I do encourage people to study them, is the notes how we point out certain details of what God tells us is going to happen, and it happens. And then we were looking here, I was looking at Revelation 13 last night to study, and it's, it's very hard to study when I can't explain it, it, it's hard to study when you're not focused. And, and this week was a hard week to focus. And last night I studied late, but I wasn't really pleased with my studying. I still had lingering questions about certain things, so I prayed about it this morning. And, when I was away. Sometimes I need to get away by myself just to think. Mm -hmm. And I have a lot to think about. And it just dawned on me how certain things that are happening now is related to what's going to happen later. And I, and I was finding that out too last night. This morning. Um, in Revelation 13, so in verse 11, it talks about probably, to me, is one of the greatest blasphemies that has been occurred in human history. And 
and that is the problem of the universal religion, the universal church that started all the way back in Genesis. I was sitting back last night and I was studying this and I was impressed with so many souls that have been lost because of this religion. And uh, it's a very sobering thought to think of all the, the souls that have been lost, that have been condemned because they spent their livelihood on this planet investing in a religion that was not accurate. And I, I'm very, it, it's very hard not to be nice and polite when you see the damage being done by this. Do you understand what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. It's very hard to be politically correct or be Jewish friend of mine said kosher about it. Mm -hmm. I'm not that way. In the end times, it has been from the very beginning in Genesis that this church will play a part in the beginning and at the end of prophecy. And what really concerned me last night was that every empire that's ever existed, this church has had a part in, including this empire. And uh, I tried to look through every empire but even it, it doesn't matter if it was the Greek meat Empire, the Roman, the Greeks, uh, the Egyptians, the Syrians, the Babylonians, the British Empire, as you go through on and on, this, this church has been a part of how they have been governed. And this church ultimately will be the church that will be the vehicle to the false prophet that will be ushered in into leading the worship of the Antichrist. Now many people say, well, Pastor, if that does not involve us, and I was, and I'm gonna bring this up right now. I was sorry that I interrupted worship with talking with Morgan, but she was talking to me about a pretty important subject, and that's being tested. When you're tested, you gotta rely on what's true and what's faithful. You cannot let certain things keep you out of focus. If someone were to tell you that the tri tribulation would have started right now, would you believe him? Would you believe him? I'm not hearing anything. Would you believe him? No. No. I, I, I don't understand. We're tested every day. Mm -hmm. I'm being tested all the time. Yeah. It's getting unnerving on me. Because the devil is trying to get me out right now before we hit it big, before the move is made when this church grows. He's trying to get me out, folks. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. And he knows that. He doesn't get after all the other idiots out there that are pastoring that are not doing hell of beings. He's only wanting those that are doing something. Mm -hmm. I'm going to tell you right now. I don't want a church that's a decorum in nature. I want a church that's passionate in nature. I want a church that's faithful in nature. I want a church that goes against the grain, that's not politically correct, that is a bold church that will face the truth and say, you know what, I spit in the eye of deceit, I spit in the eye of deception, and I spit in the eye of evil. Yeah. And that, that's exactly how Jesus wants his church to be. I'm gonna read here in, in uh, Revelation 13. The false prophet, which is the Pope. Now, is this, if this is being reported, I've noticed recently on the views, there have been some dislikes out there. I don't care if you don't like me. My existence is not here for you to like me. I will not lose sleep if you do not like me. I really don't care if you like me. But I do care if you reject the truth. That's why I do care. History, biblical history, history that is written from Jewish history and history itself will tell us that the false prophet will be the Pope of the Catholic Church. There's no doubt about it. There's no debate. He will have authority to lead the world into the worship of the Antichrist who will be 
the coming world leader. Now, if you're thinking, Pastor, again, how does that affect me? Here's how it affects you. I was going over last night over the time schedule of this. And if you read the last verse in 18, it talks about the number of the beast. He who hath wisdom, let him hear. Right? 100 years is a century. Years is the same. In those 100 years, 100 years equals a century. We're in the 21st century. Or we're starting the 21st century in the year 2013, which means that basically about 21 cycles. You divide that either two ways. Three cycles of 700, right? Or seven cycles of 300. And I'm thinking this doesn't make sense. Something's not right. Because the time period would put us 21, means that we are either in the third or the seventh dispensation period of time. And I rack my brain over this. It can't be number seven because that is the final time period of that. But the tribulation has not happened yet. It can't be this cycle because that means that we have anyone that many of the signs have not been fulfilled yet. But yet in Matthew 24, every sign has been fulfilled before the coming of the rapture. So I went over this and I just racked my brains on and I'm saying something is not right. And in Revelation 13, it starts here in verse 11. And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns and spoke like a dragon. Now notice this here. The false prophet will be a leader of religion. He's going to combine all the religions together, including Muslims and all your denominations. All that will be coming together. He will lead the world... He will have the appearance of a lamb, but will speak like a dragon. He will speak with authority and force, which means is that the Antichrist is going to prop him up and support him. Now, here's the thing. This is what I have trouble with. For this to happen, I have to go to Genesis 2, to try to find out here when this all started. So, I went to Genesis. And in Genesis chapter 10, there it is. Genesis chapter 10, it talks about Nimrod, who came from the line of Cush, who goes back to the third son of Noah, which is Ham. Now, this was in... 2218 BC. So in 2218 BC, that covers about 21 centuries, right? According to timeline. So here's what I'm getting at. This happened before. This is the time period that we're in now. So if you subtract when Nimrod started, when the Universal Church started, that's 205, right? Then I went over to the track of all these nations, all these empires that started. I went back to the Egyptian Empire. Remember Egypt and Pharaoh? Bad people. Before them was the Babylonians. Remember them? Then the Assyrians. And I went. And I studied all this. I'm talking about the Greeks, the Romans. Remember the Greek Empire and the Roman Empire? You got the Persian, the Persian Empire, which is your Middle East today. 
all these empires coming together. Then you have the British empires. You had America, which I don't, we're not, we're no longer an empire, folks. I hate to tell you that we're no longer that. I think we've pretty much seen our better days. And I was thinking, what is the key to all this besides the universal church? Because every one of these empires, the universal church, has been a part of, and their worship and their statutes and everything. It is that's the connecting line between this is the universal church. Here's what I'm getting at. All these great empires that have come and gone, and we're on the brink of this one going, and I'm thinking, what am I missing here? What is the key here? Here is the key here. I'm going, I'm going here by, this is the Jewish calendar. This is the uh, Gregorian calendar, the calendar that we use. Here is what I was trying to figure out last night. B.C. A.D. It has only been 2,000 years since Jesus Christ has been on this earth. That is not long. 20, on the verge of 21 centuries. That is three sevens. Amazing, huh? When I looked at all these empires together, and I added the time element together of when they started, this is just when they started, from the time of Genesis. You know what number I came up with? 461 years it took for each of these empires to start. When you add all the, the years together when they started, it comes out to 461 years. And when I added those numbers together, That's what was bothering me last night. I was looking at the wrong thing. I was looking at the cycle of seven, 21 uh, centuries. It has nothing to do with that. It has to do when the empires came together. Now, where did you get the 461? That's how many years it took for all these nations to come together. I added all the years in which the nations come together. Six, six, six. So basically, what you're looking at is a time period of all these nations affected by one church. And all these nations are going to come together, what is, what is now today called the United Nations, right? A leader is going to have to come from the United Nations to galvanize everything, to take over the world. Then you have the universal church. So you got your Antichrist, who will be a, a, a dictator. And then you got your false prophet. There will be the culmination of the church that started and existed, and the leaders going to come from the line of leaders that have come from these empires. Do you understand what I'm saying? The Babylonians, the Egypt, the Pharaohs, the kings, uh, the Caesars, all these people that have had leaders. These leaders stem from the line of Nimrod because that's how they govern. They govern through one person. Nimrod set up the government in Babylonia. The Babylonians not gave that to Egypt. Egypt gave that to Assyria. Assyria got, gave it to Greece. Greece gave it to Rome. Rome gave it to Persia and so on. They established it. And here's the, here's the kicker. The Antichrist is supposed to be a royal blood, right? Royal blood, part Jew. They have to have Jewish blood in them. There is only, from right now, only two places where you still have a monarchy in place. Do you know what those two places are? Egypt. No? No. Persia. No. Egypt had a king. Oh, had Pharaoh here. Pharaoh. What about now? Okay. Now, British only has a monarchy left. The Persian, which is Saudi Arabia, your Middle Eastern, they still have kings there. 
So when you drill it down to these two, that makes you wonder, does it? I still say it has to be from Persian descent. That's from the line of Edom, the Esau. But it's amazing how you look at the numbers and how they come together. You have to study those numbers. You have to study everything in its spot. And that's what bothered me last night. I was looking at the wrong thing. God says, take the time in which this started, subtract it from now, what you have over, go back to the empires, add all the number of years it took for them to establish together when they started. <coughs> and you have 461. <coughs> 205, and you have that. Wow. That's what was missing. This is the name. When you look at 666, it's not exactly the number. It's the name of the person who is the Antichrist. And we will attempt to find out who that is through the Greek, Latin, and Hebrew alphabet. They all have to match. That's going to be a chore. Um, the closest I came to was Domitian. Domitian. This is Roman, though. Guess who was Hebrew? 666. Amazing, huh? He was the betrayer of the Christ. That would make sense. Perfect sense, would it? The mission was the, he was the one that instituted Christians being fed to the lions. So you look at all this historically. Which brings us here to our notes. This is fascinating stuff. And God wants you to study. He wants you to study because it's going to be relevant later. Now, here is what I want you all to understand. The papacy, you know, it's claimed spiritual and temporal dominion. If you look throughout history, even through the time of Jesus Christ, remember when he was alive, Rome was still in power when Jesus was alive. You remember the fish? Uh, the miracle of the coin and the fish when they had to pay taxes and Jesus is going to look in that fish and there was a coin in there he said whose whose image is on that coin? Caesar give to Caesar what Caesar's and give to the Lord what's Lord's so back then the Roman Empire was in control when Jesus was alive on this earth when Jesus died it was under Roman law that he died shortly after that the Roman Empire went away it failed Here's the scary part. The Pope gave the authority for the Roman Empire to cease. He signed a law saying there will be no Roman Empire. Now who gives this man the authority and the power to do that? It says right in your notes. The Pope not only claims to be a car of Christ, the car means representative, but the rightful ruler of the kings of the earth. The Pope has authority over all the kings of the earth. In, in the mind of the Popal Edict, the Popal Edict is a book that the Roman Catholic Church has that claims that the Pope has power to rule over the kings of the earth when need be. Now folks, when you put that together, you're looking at a dictator of religion. Do you understand what I'm saying? You're looking at a dictator of religion. That it's happening now. Recently the Pope made a remark saying that homosexuality in priesthood and the priest is acceptable. It's a private thing. Well, first of all, this last Pope that we, and I believe it is the last one, he comes from the Jesuits. The Jesuits are militant in nature. They were the ones main parts of the Spanish Inquisition. They were the people that led Holland into blood, uh, to a bloody holocaust if they did not turn toward Catholicism. Catholicism, if you go back to the roots in their early history, they've always had bloody wars over religion. The reason that the United States of America left Britain was because partly of taxes and religion. We did not want the church to govern us. 
we surely didn't want the Catholic Church or back then the Anglican Church to come and rule over us. But instead we've created the Catholic Church for secular humanism, it seems like. It says here, it claims to represent Christianity, but is that not Christian in doctrine and practice? Every denomination that has existed has come from the Catholic Church. Lutheranism, Methodist, Episcopalian, you go on and on. You've traced the roots back. And I have a little book in my bag there that tells you the history of it. I will show you that the, every denomination that has existed has come from the roots of Catholicism, of the Universal Church. There is only one that has not come from Catholicism. And ironically enough, that is the church that Jesus established himself. Part of the reason why, and it, and it says in Jewish history, that when Jesus came on, this, on in the book of Matthew and started his church, the Pharisees were against it because they were of the Jewish law. But there was also another group against Jesus establishing his church, and that was the revived Roman Empire. The revived Roman Empire and the Roman Empire, the Caesars of that time, felt threatened because they were worshipped as gods. The Pharisees had control over the nation of Israel through their, through their laws and through their traditions. These two came into cahoots, came together, and plotted to kill Jesus because he was seen as a threat against religion and against government. So when you combine all those together, you're looking at the making since the beginning of Genesis of what will happen in Revelation. And what you see here is that religion and government have always played a role when it comes to empires and the governing of people. And they have all had one thing in common. In America, you can add America to that today. Oh no, we're one nation under God. No, we're not anymore. We have lost that identity. Have you noticed in those empires, there's one empire not in there? That's Israel. Israel has not been affected by the universal church. Because that is God's nation and God has sovereignly protected that nation. Now, it says here about the Antichrist, he will exercise all the power of the first beast before him and cause it of the earth and them that dwell therein to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. And he had he dealt great wonders so that he make a fire come down from heaven on the earth on the side of men. We are not going to be a part of this because we will be raptured. I need to make that very clear. The church will not be a part of this because we will be gone. God will take us home before this happens. That's the good news. The bad news is, is that everyone on this planet, for the most part, except the the remnant of Israel and the 144,000 uh, Jews that have been sovereignly protected to preach the gospel to Israel, everyone else will receive the mark of the beast and pretty much die. They will sign their death warrant. Mm -hmm. Now, all of us have been affected by this and all of us have been conditioned to this. All of us have has a number. Did you know that your social security is your personal ID number? in which the government can tell you. That is your number, and they can find you anywhere with that social security number. They can look up your records, criminal records, speeding tickets, they can look up records of your life, races where you had work, your past work history, they can look up everything through your social security number. Recently it has come out that the government through NSA and other government operations and for the sake of protection, homeland security protection, have look, have access to all of our files as Americans. They know every bit of our business. Privacy is no longer true here in this country. The Antichrist, when he takes power, will have access to every person's ID, code, existence on this planet. The Antichrist will have such power over the economics and the welfare of this of this world that he will, at a, at a certain touch, he will know where people live and what they do and he will control them or kill them. So this is all that we're living in right now. We're living in the time period, folks, where we're beginning to see the signs of the Antichrist putting his uh, machine into action, putting his plan into action. 
It's not a coincidence that our government has access to our files. That has been going on for years. It has been going on since the 1940s. You remember when FDR implemented the Great Act, uh, implemented uh, Social Security Act? You remember that? He gave everyone a number. Everyone has access to certain benefits. Okay, here's the key. That number is not only a number to, for you to get Medicare and Medicaid, but that number the government can tell you, tell you, and find out everything about you even need be. That is against the law. The government has no right into the private lives of its people. But we have seen recently with Egypt, we saw recently in the Arab Spring, we see now in Syria, that the leaders of government do not hesitate to fight against the people of its country. Syria, now here's what makes Syria such a bad thing. King Assad comes from a military family. He took over that country by military rule. Rebels want him out. They want freedom. They want choice. They want a better country for Syria. He wants his tyrannical hand over that nation. The rebels were gaining the upper hand and trying to overthrow him. So what does he do? He pulls out nerve gas and kills not only the rebels, but their wives and their children. Now here's my question to you. Does any leader of any country have the right to go after and kill their own citizens? Does any country have the right to dictate and kill its own people for the sake of imperialism or tyrannical rule? The Caesars did it. The pharaohs of Egypt did it. The kings of the Mede and Persians did it. The people of the Middle East did it. Heck, even the British Empire did it. Everyone has done its martial law to try to control the people and if it need be kill the people to kill its will. Now before you say that will never happen in America, that's not going to happen in the United States of America. Hell will freeze over, pigs will fly. Before that happens in America, I will give you 9-11. 9-11 was not supposed to happen. It happened, right? Uh, interestingly enough, the economic collapse back in 2008, going back into the Depression, uh, back when was it in the 1920s? That was not supposed to happen. It happened. We are one edict away from the United Nations of giving up our sovereignty because we are in so much in debt and we have to pay so much that if we join the United Nations under this one edict, we will lose our sovereignty as a country and all our bills will be paid. You know, I don't know about y'all, have you ever get ahead of your bills? It's like me. It's like an endless pit feeding. You never get full. The economic monster does not get full. You will always pay bills. Even when you die, they come after the living people to get money for their bills. Okay? We will never get ahead as far as paying bills in this country. I mean, you may, you may own a house or car, but if you don't pay taxes on your property or land, they could come after you still, right? Businesses are the same way. There is no way out of this vicious cycle of paying debt, paying taxes. We will do that until we die. Even rich people. Donald Trump, he lost his hair and has fake hair now. But he, he lost his hair over the thought of losing everything that he has because of taxes and debt. Did you know that many of these empires not only lost by wars, but they lost economically as well? Because they, you know, the Persians, they got the oil. Okay. They're sitting pretty right now. We were sitting pretty, but we lost that out. But all these nations, economically, also suffered as well. There are three ways to control a people. Economics, religion, and law. You control a people by the money they earn, by what they believe, and the laws they live by. If you can control a nation in those three ways, you've got a nation. Hitler tried to do it, Mussolini tried to do it, Stalin tried to do it. That's how they try to control a nation. And the Antichrist will do it too. The Antichrist will do it, here's how. <coughs> False prophet. One world religion. 
666. That's economics. You cannot buy or sell unless you have that number. Now, folks, I'm going to tell you something right now. There will be people left behind. They're going to have to face this. Then, of course, you have your one world government. In which the Antichrist will be the dictator. You control it through religion, economics, and by law, by how people are going. That's how they're going to do it. Now, back in 1970, back in 1970, da 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 da, no wait, 78, back in 1978 there was a test run by certain rock musicians involving 666. What happens was is that they actually coded the music within the music a message to the devil. They have found out that in that coded message to the devil they actually provided information on the 666 number. And if you remember Aleister Crowley, you remember Aleister Crowley. He's the one that invented backward masking. That man's a sick pervert. Okay. He is he was the one that persuaded Anton LaVey to establish the Church of Satan in San Francisco. And you want to know why San Francisco is so messed up? Because they have a demonic spirit there that leads people into the gay lifestyle, the homosexual lifestyle. That's not an accident. That is real. Do you understand? If you go up the west coast, that demonic spirit is spreading all over the place. In Washington, you can get high marijuana and it could be legalized. They're trying to legalize it. There are two reasons why they want to legalize it. Number one, so they can tax it. That's more money for the government. And number two, they can control the people through that drug. Okay? Colorado, mushrooms. I like mushrooms in my pizza, but not these kind of mushrooms. These are the kind of mushrooms that uh, uh, Jim Morrison made famous with his psychedelic, funky music lifestyle and eventually died of it. You go out through the East Coast. The East Coast is secular humanism indeed. Planned Parenthood received a $1 million per year, per year gap from Washington, D.C. for the sole purpose of, get this, child insurance. Now you and I both know that children do not get insurance from Planned Parenthood. Child insurance, all it is is that pregnant mothers that want to have an abortion can get it free from Planned Parenthood. That's all it is. All this for the sake of freedom, all this in the sake of rights, civil rights. The fifth, I want to, my, I want to ask a question out there. Martin Luther King, 50 years ago, gave a I Have a Dream speech. Why hasn't a single Republican been invited to this event? They want unity, right? They want inclusion. Why didn't he invite them? Why wasn't a single preacher, Protestant, biblical preacher, invited to this event? Why? Because they do not want the people to start realizing what this is. This is not about unity. This is about separation. And folks, if we do not understand this, Jesus Christ came on this planet to only unite his people. That's it. He did not come to unite the world because if he did, then the world would be saved. There would be no destruction of the world, right? But he came to do the very thing that people don't understand is that he came to unite his people from the world. Not to become part of it, but from the world. Black Sabbath. 
the tattoo of the phoenix is the same tattoo that was used by the Roman Empire to tattoo to mark its people with Caesar's name on it. Caesar's name came out to be 666. Every Caesar through Roman style has been given with that same numerical code. Does that scare you? It should scare you. The music that has come in from the days of the 70s in which the demonic hold of this country came into being. It wasn't the 50s. Rock and roll in the 50s, that's not when it came in. It was through the 70s, folks. The 70s were a time period in which people from the 60s to their psychedelic era gained away and, and uh, moved away further away from God during that time period. So you put all that together, eventually this has led to the destruction of the United States morally. And if a country is ruined morally, then the country cannot stand. Because their own principles and values will not stand. It will be lost. In verses 15 through 17, the lost world will worship with their lives to the Antichrist. Now, I want you to understand what that means. The lost world will worship with their lives to the Antichrist. Worship is very important when you worship God. You're giving your affection, your allegiance, your heart, your soul to God. That's part of worship. That's part of your relationship with God. That's how you worship Him. Don't get lost in the detail. It's not only worshiping on Sundays that we worship God. It's how we live our lives the other six days of the week. It's 24-7. The choices we make the things that we do and the things that we don't do also are in consideration of how we worship God. If we worship God and if we fail to worship God in the simplest of choices, then we will also cause catastrophic damage to our spiritual lives with the bigger choices of life. If we cannot make a simple choice of what is pleasing to God, let's say in food or music, then you're going to ruin your life by the, who you plan to spend your life with, which is the, one of the major choices of life. And a lot of people have been ruined by that one choice alone. And I could speak testimony to that. Almost declared bankruptcy. I mean, I was also, I mean, ruined financially. I still am to a bit, but not as bad as bankruptcy. Because of the wrong choice when I said, I said I do to the wrong person. That is a choice that will haunt me now for a long time. There's some choices in your life that you may take a second to say yes or no to, but the effects of it will be felt long after that. And see, we don't teach our kids that. We teach them to do what they can, suck it up, live it up, get over it, you'll be fine. Really? I don't know about you, but if you're suffering and you feel like you're suffering alone, it's hard. The devil wants to do this to the people. The devil wants to take advantage of their people and their pain and their suffering and their misery. He promises them something temporal, something like a mirage, something that is there but is not there in order to get their worship, in order to get their life. That's amazing, isn't it, how the devil works? The devil promised Adam and Eve, he promised Eve the, uh, the all-knowing knowledge. If you eat of this forbidden fruit of this tree, of, of the knowledge of good and evil, what did he tell her? You will be as gods. But she took the bait. And so did Adam. The devil also again came into existence when he tried to tempt again the Lord Jesus Christ in the New Testament. When he tried to tempt him through giving him the kingdoms of the world. Tempting him to, to risk his own life. All the temptations he did with Jesus Christ was to show the world that he would try to deceive our king. Of course Jesus did not fall for any of that. The devil is in the business of deceiving. The devil is in the business of getting your soul. That's all he wants is your soul. He can promise you the world, the moon, and the stars, but eventually what he really wants is you. These kingdoms are trophies in the hands of the devil because the devil has been the controller and the destroyer of every one of them.
I made a remark about Bill O'Reilly and he nailed it on the head a few weeks ago. I was talking with Kathy with this, talking about the, the black people because of Trayvon Martin and everything has happened. The destruction of, of, that, of that race, the destruction of those families, is not because of drugs or music. It's because there is a lack of a strong family base for those kids. And when you do not have a strong base in family, and family is the, is the root of society, a strong society is built on strong families. If you can weaken and destroy the family, you can weaken and destroy society as a whole. Jesus came to establish the family as the root of a strong society. He came to say that when Jesus was on this earth, he says, obey your mother and your father, right? One of the Ten Commandments, honor your mother and your father. That's one of the Ten Commandments. Jesus said in the book of Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 1, obey your parents for this is right in the Lord. Obedience. Obey your parents. Honor your mother and father. The respect of family goes deep. But now, the disintegration of the family leads to no respect to the leaders of the family. There is no respect for the mother and father. There is no respect for the grandparents. The grandparents are now becoming the parents of the family. You thought you were finished raising kids, huh? <laughs> no! The hits keep on coming. <laughs> Fox Business News. All 18 to 35 year olds, 75% will earn less than $30,000 a year. It is estimated that it takes at least $45,000 a year to live on your own. If you make under $30,000, you cannot make it on your own. You cannot pay for rent, gas, electricity, car, car insurance, health, health insurance, food, whatever. There are more kids living at home with their parents now in the year 2013 than there were 20, 30, and 40 years years ago. Our, economy, our economic collapse has produced fewer jobs for more people. Here's a shocking, shocking statistic. 18 of our 35 year olds today, 50% have at least two jobs just to make ends meet. Two jobs every day. When do you have time to go dating? When do you have time to raise a family? When do you have time to do anything? You're too busy working trying to pay your bills. Food stamps, the savior, food stamps in the next four years will be cut by 30% because of Obamacare. <laughs> your poor people are going to have to find another way to eat. Medicare will be cut by 35% because of Obamacare. If you have free insurance for like health screenings and all that, that will be cut by 25%. In other words, you're gonna have to pay more out of your pocket to get the same benefits. What are we saying here? Here's what we're saying. Economically, we are on the verge of collapse. We do not have enough money to pay for the safety of our elderly people, and we don't have enough money to pay for the poor people. So what does that leave us? We are up a creek. And the only way out is that someone will have to rescue us financially to get us out. Now who do you think that's going to be? Who do you think is going to come in and promise us a clean slate like bankruptcy court and say, I will pay for every debt, but I want your soul. We have a president that will do that. You're racist! No, it has nothing to do with the color of his skin, but the content of his character. That's what it has to do with. When a president tells us that we are no longer one nation under God, that we are no longer under the Judeo-Christian God, that there are many gods that we can pick in this nation, that we have just screwed ourselves. Where is the church in its voice to declare the truth? Where is the church to stand up against such foolishness? Where is the church to stand up against the heresy of this world? Where is the church to stand up against the demonic devices of Satan? 
Where is the church to stand up? This is the truth. Where are our leaders? Where are the pastors out there that are willing to come out and speak the truth? No matter if they lose their hedge fund, no matter if they lose their, their, their props, no matter if they lose all their, that they've earned. Where are the people that will stand up and say, this is not the way. This is not the way of God Almighty. Where are is the people? They are not there. They are gone. I'm here. But the rest are not there. I want to read something from here in number two. On your notes. On your page. I got the copy. It's on the bottom, number two. Number two. Number two. should be in the back. Page five or six? Two. It's in the back. God tests us every day through choices. Good choices. If you trust people that know they won't hurt you, if you trust people that knows what's best for you, that's a good thing. <clears throat> but if you trust systems that you don't know about, if you trust systems that try to take advantage of you, that's a bad thing. In His infinite wisdom on the very bottom, in His infinite wisdom, God has given us a preview of coming attractions. He alone knows the future. And I'm going to emphasize that again. He alone knows the future. The reason that we trust in the Lord with all our heart is because He alone knows the future and He alone dictates it. However, because He also controls the future, these glimpses are not meant to simply enliven our curiosity. They are given to warn those, listen to this, they are given to warn those who choose to reject Christ, who choose to reject Christ and to encourage believers in Christ to live a life of faith until he returns. The time that we're living right now is not wasted time. We're not just simply waiting for Christ to come back. We are to live a life of faith for him till he gets back. We are to make investments in the kingdom of heaven through the choices that we make. We are to make investments into the kingdom of heaven through the life that we live. We are to, we are to make investments into the kingdom of heaven through the life of the Savior now. So this time is not dead time waiting for Him to come back. This is the time given to us to live and to enrich our lives and to enhance Him and to glorify Him now. Knowing God, knowing the God who holds the future in His hands should impact how we live today. I'm going to read that again. Knowing the God who holds the future in His hands of you and I should impact how we live today. This is the most important line that I want to leave you with this evening. And please memorize this. Put this in your heart. Though we cannot change the course of the future, we can let the truth about the future change us. Even though we cannot change the course of our future, we should let the truth about the future change us. See, we worry about changing things. God wants to change us. Let me give you an example. Who do you think was changed that day at the Red Sea? When you have two and a half million Jews and Moses at the Red Sea. Once they crossed the Red Sea, who was changed that day? Moses and the, and the Jewish people. Before, they had to live on faith to live, right? On one side of the sea, they were counting on faith. On the other side of the sea, they rejoiced in their faith. Who was changed that day? Israel was, and Moses. Give you another example, David and Goliath. Who was changed that day? By faith. David and the nation of Israel once again. See, David's faith would not have been strong if he did not go through what he did. Here's the hard part about Christians that we have to understand. Sometimes we have to go through battles for us to get better. You have to be battle tested. You have to go through the test. You have to go through the, through the valleys. 
you have to go through the wars, you have to go through the fire, you have to go through pain, you have to go through suffering in order for us to be better. It's like me physically. To this day, the reason I'm sitting here before you is by the grace of God, number one, and because of all the exercises I've done in my life, saved my life. Because I was, I did not tell Kathy this or the girls, but I'm going to tell you now. And I kept this from them because I did not want to alarm them. But I better come clean because I don't want God to hold me accountable. The first time I was taken to the hospital, they did an AKG on me. And he said, sir, um, we're going to do another EKG on you. I said, go ahead. I knew what it was, and I didn't want to admit it. Dr. Kim says, uh, uh, sir, you want the virtual heart attack. Now, I said, doctor, this wasn't the big one, was it? No, no, no. But because your heart is so strong, your heart is so strong when it when it beat you regularly. It said boom, 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 boom. Your heart went boom, boom. Long beats. Your heart is so strong that it took those long beats. It kept on going. Wow. So what do you suggest I do? Don't ever do 400 pounds again on squat. Don't do that, son. You don't need to. You're not Samson. Don't do 400 pounds again. He said, but because you're a cardio, aerobically, you're so strong, that's what saved you. Wow, dang. I must know my dad that day. Um, you know why another reason God preserved me? Because I have a family that loves me and I have a church that counts on me. And Jesus says, son, you're not going home anytime soon. I got you here because you're the only one that's doing what you're supposed to do. And I'm sorry to tell you, but you're going to have to stay here. Oh, darn! <laughs> my asthma, my lungs. He says my lung capacity is double what it should be because of all the aerobics I did. So that's what's been saving me, too. So I know you're going to get mad at me. I know you're going to throw things at me. That's fine. I'm not expecting it. But uh, have a good take care of a good heart, literally and physically. And uh, but God wanted me here. That's why He says, though we cannot change the course of the future, we can let the truth of the, about the future change us. Yes. Here's the future. Here's the future in a nutshell. Our, our future is this. When we think about our future, we think about the people, the place, the environment, who we're with or we won't be with. We think about details of our future. I don't want you to think about that. You know how they ask you a question, what are you gonna, what's going to be like in five years? What are you going to do in five years when you go for a job interview? I can't an honestly answer that because I don't know. It's a very stupid question. But here's a question that's not stupid. What do you think of your future? Do you think of a person? Do you think of a place? Do you think of a job? When you think of the future, what's the first thing you think of? Here's the test. If you are spirit-filled, Bible-believing, Christ-led Christian, the first that should have been popping into your soul is Jesus. Jesus is your future. Wherever Jesus is, that's what we are. Don't get lost in the detail. Don't get lost on retirement, or don't get lost on raise or promotion or bigger house or car. 
when people think of their future, they're always thinking of temporal, superficial, physical, concrete things. I want you to think about your life and your soul. These people that receive the mark of the Antichrist have their future sealed. They're going to hell. These empires, they thought they were going to be around forever. They failed. Why? Because Jesus was not in the future. Jesus was not the focal point of their path. Jesus was not the foundation of their life. When I think about my future, I think about the Jesus because he has saved my life. He has preserved me, given me hope, resurrected me. He has done everything to literally keep me afloat. Because without him, I would not be sitting here today. And I can tell you that right now. When you think of your future, who or what do you think? And as we bow our heads in prayer, I want you to think about your future. I don't know how long you have. I don't know how long I have. Maybe 10 years, 20 years, maybe one week. I don't know. But what I do know is this, is that whatever time you have, we have left on this earth. Heck, the rapture could happen tomorrow. We all go home anyway. Amen. Amen. But whatever, whatever time that we have left, what is the purpose of our future? That's what I want you to come to terms with this morning. When you leave these doors, when we walk out, the next minute could be the last minute. Where are we going? Where? Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for this day. And we thank you for all the blessings you've given us. And tonight we, we thank you for so many things. That's the one thing we don't say enough to you, Lord, is we thank you. And I know I don't, and I should. I do thank you. I thank you for all the blessings you've given me family. I do pray for my mom and my brother going through a hard time physically. Um, mom told me today she would felt alone. I don't know, Lord. I, I, I don't know. I'm going to spend as much time with her as I can. Um, Lord, I just pray for our future. The future of this nation, the future of our leaders, the future of our families. Some of us don't know what the future holds. We don't know what job we're going to have. We don't know what we're going to do. We don't know how we're going to make our bills. But you know everything. You know the future. Lord, instead of us worrying about the future, Help us to live toward the future by believing in you. Help us not to make foolish choices just to do something or to have someone or to be someone. Help us to live for you in you and allow you to make the choices for us. And allow you to pick what's best for us. And allow you to know and live and give what's best for us. That is how we are supposed to live as Christians. Not depending on our understanding, on our experience, on our so-called wisdom. That's not how we live as Christians. We live by every word that cometh out of the word of Jesus. We live by the word of God. We live by the water of his word. We live by his example, his spirit, and we trust in him. That's how we live. The righteous shall live by faith. And that faith is in you. It's not in any church, any pastor, any pope, any king, any president, anything else, any human being. It's only in you. And that is how we live as a Christian. 
we live day to day, minute to minute, because we don't know who holds, we don't know the future, we don't hold it, but you do. You know what's going to happen to us in five years, in five minutes. You know everything. So we trust you because you do know everything. We trust you because you're perfect. We trust you because you're holy. But most of all, we trust you because you love us. And that is why ultimately we trust in you with all, our, all of our heart and lean not unto our own understandings, Lord. You save our lives. You enhance them. You build them. You regenerate them. You resurrect them. And no matter what the devil throws at us, it is a lie. It's a deceit. Help us to be wise Christians and not fall for anything that the devil throws at us. Help us to be wise and smart. Help us to be cunning. Help us to know, Lord, and live by your wisdom and spirit so that we will not fall into the traps of the devil. We pray this mightily. We thank you, Lord. Fill us with your spirit. Help us to trust in your word and help us to follow your steps. In the mighty Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.